Ventricular septal defect is the most common type of congenital heart disease. It occurs in 32% of infants born with congenital heart disease. It involves an abnormal communication between the right ventricle and the left ventricle that can be found in various positions within the ventricular septum. There are many types of ventricular septal defect. The most common ones are the following. The supracrystal or double committed defect is located above the crista supraventricularis and is superiorly delineated by the fibrous continuity between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. The muscular defect can be located anywhere within the ventricular septum. This type of defect has a completely muscular border, central muscular or apical muscular defect. The perimembranous defect, the most common one, involves the membranous interventricular septum below the aorta. Blood pressure is usually higher in the left ventricle than in the right ventricle. Therefore, blood flows across the defect from left towards right, causing a left to right shunt. The magnitude of the shunt depends on the size of the defect. The left to right shunt usually causes an increase in right ventricular pressure and progression to the pulmonary artery vascular disease. But increasing of ventricular pressure may reduce the shunt and in those cases with severe pulmonary vascular disease, the shunt may even reverse right to left, thereby causing cyanosis. Clinical aspects of ventricular septal defect depend on the size of the defect and pulmonary vascular resistance. Small defects may cause no symptoms and are most likely to close spontaneously. Medium-sized defects may cause no symptoms or may cause recurrent respiratory infections and retarded growth. Large defects may cause recurrent respiratory infections and retarded growth. They may even cause severe heart failure during the first months of life. In children with ventricular septal defect, a systolic murmur may be heard. But in case of high right ventricular pressure, no systolic murmur may be heard. The most useful methods of diagnosis are electrocardiography, ECG, chest radiography, echocardiography, cardiac catheterization. Electrocardiography may reveal no evidence of small or medium-sized defects, but it might show signs of biventricular hypertrophy in case of large defects. Chest radiography reveals no evidence of small or medium-sized defects, but it shows cardiomegaly, the abnormal enlargement of the heart, and increased pulmonary vascular markings in case of large defects. Echocardiography usually allows a comprehensive diagnosis of all types of ventricular septal defect and enables the evaluation of pulmonary artery pressure. Commonly, indications for surgical correction are based on clinical symptoms and echocardiographic results. This is a large muscular ventricular septal defect shown on the apical four-chamber view. The left ventricle appears dilated and globular shaped with signs of failure. Cardiac catheterization is needed to measure pulmonary vascular resistance, magnitude of the shunt, and to evaluate other associated congenital heart defects. In these cases, cardiac catheterization is required in order to decide if corrective surgery should be performed. Diuretic, digoxin and vasodilator therapies may be useful in the first months of life for patients who present symptoms of ventricular septal defect and that are waiting for surgery. Nowadays, there are two types of corrective surgery for ventricular septal defect, surgical repair and percutaneous intervention. About 50% of ventricular septal defects close spontaneously within the first two or three years of life and no surgical repair therefore is needed. 
Operative indications vary according to the type of ventricular septal defect. Small defects require surgical repair only when an aortic regurgitation is associated. Medium-sized defects commonly require surgical repair after the first or second year of life. Large defects require surgical repair within the sixth month of life. Surgical repair for ventricular septal defect should not be performed in patients who have already developed pulmonary vascular disease, unresponsive to vasodilators, and in patients with right to left shunt. There are two types of surgical repair, palliative surgery and corrective surgery. Palliative surgery involves pulmonary artery banding. The procedure narrows the pulmonary artery in order to reduce pulmonary artery flow and pressure, allowing patients to reach the ideal age for corrective surgery. Palliative surgery should be performed for the following cases of ventricular septal defect. Infants with multiple defects should undergo surgical palliation during the first months of life. For underweight children who should not undergo corrective surgery under extracorporeal circulation, with other associated congenital heart diseases, for example, coarctation of the aorta, with severe respiratory infections, when corrective surgery under extracorporeal circulation should not be carried out. Corrective surgery is carried out under extracorporeal circulation and involves closure of the ventricular septal defect with placement of a pericardial patch or a dacron patch. According to the type of the defect, there are three different surgical approaches. The transatrial approach, through the right atrium, the transventricular approach through the right ventricle and approach through the pulmonary artery. Supracrystal defects may be approached through the pulmonary artery. Apical muscular defects may be approached through the right ventricular apex, transventricular approach. The animation shows here corrective surgery for ventricular septal defect carried out performing the transatrial approach. Firstly, a right atriotomy is performed and surgeons proceed with the evaluation of the defect through the tricuspid valve. The animation shows here the ventricular septal defect and the conducting tissues. Then, the defect is repaired with placement by suture of a pericardial or other patch. Finally, Closure of the right atrium is carried out. The catheter is inserted through the femoral artery and advanced up into the aorta and then into the left ventricle. Finally, it is pushed through the ventricular septal defect into the right ventricle. An exchange guide wire is positioned into the pulmonary artery. Another catheter is advanced into the right atrium using venous approach from the femoral vein and it is advanced up into the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Then an arterial venous wire loop is established for crossing the defect from the left ventricle. The guiding catheter is then removed from the aorta and pushed through the defect into the left ventricle. The device is now advanced through the guiding catheter. The distal disc is opened into the left ventricle to deploy the device in the defect. Once position is confirmed by echocardiography or angiography, the device is retracted to deploy the proximal disc.